and everyone that's here, specifically before you, uniquely, Lord, according to the desire of our heart, according to the purpose wherein, Lord, you have drawn us, according to the need that's within us. Be it, Lord, for edification, deliverance, healing, direction, wisdom, impartation, whatever it may be, I ask, Lord, in this service, the impartation of an adequate portion to the meeting of every need. Father, I thank you. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Quicken us together. Lift us. Grant us, Lord, that open heaven. Lord, it's much easier to talk about an open heaven than it is to have one. Don't let us be satisfied with just talking about it. But oh, that we may gather ourselves as one. And in faith, Lord, in that anointing that would penetrate the heavenlies and push back every principality and power. For in the authority of your word, Lord, we speak forth that creative word of life. Every principality, every power, every demon move back, hallelujah. Move back and release the anointing, the enabling power, the word of God. Move back, hallelujah. Hallelujah, flee these grounds and leave in Jesus' name. For we sanctify, clarify these grounds, the buildings, the people, totally and fully cleared and free. Every principality, power, demon, you are defeated. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, thank you, Lord. And in that name, which is worthy, which is above every name, we speak that word of release, of anointing, of an enabling, that the sun, that the S-O-N, oh, shine upon us, Lord, through a clarity of atmosphere, of your presence. We thank you, Lord. And carefully, Lord, in the service this evening, we lift all, acknowledging you, our dependence, our need. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. 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 Okay, let's see. Today is Wednesday. Monday night, basically, what I said was that... We are a supernatural people, born of the Spirit. Last night, because we are a supernatural people, we need a supernatural atmosphere. That is, a heavenly atmosphere of the heavens, of an open heaven. We're called to that. The judgment that came on the world, the principalities gaining control from Adam, and darkness coming and Adam being cast out of the garden, All of that applies to the world. I remember a year or two, about two years ago, I think specifically lamenting inflation and all of the struggles. And inflation has taken up. There was a time when we had a little bit of money to fix something or do something, but it just seems that prices and inflation and and government requirements and all that's happening is just just choose up any 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 dollar we save there's there's something happens that wants two dollars and so I get I knew probably have the same problem and so uh, I was lamenting and I was saying to the Lord I said things are getting worse and worse and, and I said oh Lord you know we're, we're at the end and that's what because The nations have got to acknowledge that they can't rule themselves. See, they are. They are today. They are ruling themselves. And they've got to come to the place where they acknowledge that they need the Lord and acknowledge Him. And at least this nation had the wisdom to put, at least on the currency, in God we trust. And I believe we're blessed in large measure because that's there. But in about, within, in about 1992, there's a new currency coming out. 
all these all this will be exchanged if there's a crash before then it'll be exchanged it's so much on the new dollar not a hundred percent exchange but if things hold together it'll probably be exchanged a dollar on a dollar the new money will have metal in it so that metal detectors can pick it there's all kinds of things built into it it's an international money it's part of the antichrist system and it'll probably be released in 1992 if everything stays on schedule so we're headed towards the climax of the ages and things are getting they're not going to get better they're going to get worse and Jesus said in the last days they'll say peace peace but there'll be no peace and so it's we're, we're headed towards some real difficult times and 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 I remember I was praying and I was lamenting the fact what I'd like to do is start up in the front building where the reception wind is and start upstairs the windows are bad they let cold in and I'd like to just start one room at a time and take the windows out and just clean the room right out and take the windows out put a brand new window insulate it rewire it and you put fire rated sheetrock on and treated plywood and nice new carpet and we'd have a brand new just room by room and we've been what we've wanted to do it and I think about at least probably 10 times we've been right on the edge where I thought now we're going to start and the next day something happened and the little bit of money we had to start one room was gone and we and we've and I and I was lamenting the fact that we had not been able to start to do anything. I say, oh Lord, it's too bad. If only we if if we just could have started sooner or gotten here sooner before we did. And and it's just things are getting and the as, and the Lord spoke. What the Lord said was this: said things are getting worse for the world, but you're not the world. You're my people. You're the church. And for the church, things are getting what? Better. Better. See, there's a new age. And the word says that the riches of the Gentiles will come to his people, to the Lord's people. I don't understand that. We could sure use some. <laughs> I don't understand that, but that's what the book says, that the riches of the Gentiles will come to the Lord's people. And, and there's the closing out. The children of Israel came out of Egypt yes. with, all, with the wealth of the Egyptians. They, they carried it out. And in the last days, the, the word of God says that the wealth of the Gentiles will come. So for the church, things shouldn't be getting worse. They should be getting better. It's the old story of looking at a glass of water that's half filled. Do you see it? And you say, oh, that, that, that's half empty. You say, oh, hallelujah, it's half filled. <laughs> see, it depends on, you, you can weep and lament that it's half empty, or you can look and say, hallelujah, it's half full. It, it's the way you look at it. Yes. And so if we look through, through the perspective of the world, things are getting worse. But they're getting worse that every knee shall bow. Mm. Amen. And the word says that every son Every son, legitimate son, that the Lord receives, he scourges. That's a, that's a heavy word. And, and those whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Now, if he does that to his own, <laughs> just think what the world's in for. If he does that, if he scourges his sons and chastens those that are seeking him and love him, just think what the world is in for. So things are going to get worse. And... But we're not to look at that. I don't have a full understanding of this. And we're not going to get involved in it tonight, but just for about five minutes. But there was a multitude that came to Jesus to see miracles. And I believe it was Philip came and said, and said they're hungry. And basically what Philip said is there's a McDonald's over in the next town. Should we send them over there? And Jesus said, no, you feed them. And to simplify it, he said 200 pennies worth, that's probably about $30, but we'll say 200 pennies worth, well, we'll say $2, whatever it was, whether it was $30 or $2, it doesn't matter. There was 5,000 men besides women and children. And whatever resources that they had were totally inadequate, totally inadequate. Jesus said, you feed them. And a little lad 
See, the multitude was fed because they were fed on the level of their hunger. This is dangerous. The Lord will give us the desire of our heart. And this is dangerous. For those that really want the Lord, the Lord will give us the desire of our heart. They were hungry. The children of Israel wanted meat. They got quail. But the scripture says it brought leanness. So the Lord will feed us. So the multitudes were fed. They were observers. They were curiosity seekers. They came to see a good show. If we brought in one of the big names and advertised it, we, wouldn't, we, we couldn't begin to get the people in that would come. And we, in, in 20 years, there's a little, at the back of the banner, it says conventions with some dates. It never says who's going to speak. I don't know if we'll change that or not. Because sometimes I think maybe it would be good to say. Although I usually don't know. <laughs> Until it's too late to put it in the banner. But I wondered if, if we should. But then see, then people come for the speaker. And I'd rather not have that. Where, where we're picking a message or a speaker. We say, well, we're going to teach such and such and such and such a speaker. So the conventions are listed. And there's always a good turnout. But they never know. And neither, usually I don't either until almost the last minute. But I think that's good. But you see, the multitude came to see a good show. They heard that something was going on. They were fed on the level of their hunger. The Lord himself took the loaves and fishes, break them, and multiplied them. There isn't any restaurant that could serve you a meal as good as they ate. And there were 12 basketfuls. Now the miracle is this. The real miracle was not for the multitude, but Jesus said to the disciples, consider the numbers, what, what happened? And this is repeated later. They were asked a second time, do you remember? And they repeated back. There was a little lad, that's important. Dependency, a little lad. There were five loaves and two fishes. Jesus took that five and two or seven, so six and one and four and three. But it had to be. Five loaves, two fishes. Seven is the number of completion. Five is a good number. Speaks of grace. Two speaks of obedience. The Lord required obedience of Adam in the garden. He placed the tree of life. But you cannot have obedience unless there is the possibility to, to disobey. It's impossible. You can't have obedience unless there's an alternative. So, there ha so two is the number of obedience. There has to be that alternative. Two. The scripture says this, a verse that back in the 1950s that changed my life. This was a major turning point in my life in the mid-1950s. This verse stood out like neon. So, and you won't have to turn to it. I can pretty well tell you what it says. It's Isaiah 119. The willing and the obedient shall eat the good of the land to feed on the Lord glory, hallelujah, to partake of that which pertains to eternal things. To hear, not the letter, but the spirit. The letter kills, but the spirit. It's, it, it's that meaning within the word. It's the word within the word that feeds the inner man. The willing and the obedient. That verse transformed, changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. A willingness, a desire. Draw me, we will run. Hunger, spiritual hunger, desire. That doesn't just happen. It's not normal. It's not natural. It has to be God-given. Yes. No man can come except he's drawn. You've got to pray for spiritual hunger. You don't have it. You can't work it up. You've got to ask for it. You've got to look to the Lord for spiritual hunger and desire. It isn't natural. It's not naturally normally there. You've, you've got to go after it. You've got to be hungry to get hungry, <laughs> literally. And so the willing, the attitude of the heart, the obedient, always our growth, our spiritual growth is based on testing and proving, on a yieldedness, on a seeking of the Lord, on responding to the promptings and the workings of the Lord within our life. We are his workmanship, created unto good works. See, what are the good works? The circumstances that are going to form us, 
like, like, like a set of tools, circumstances that form us into his image and his likeness. We are his workmanship, created, in Ephesians 2.10, created unto good works. The good works are the situations that the Lord arranges in our life to test us, to prove us, to produce obedience, and to release understandings in the realm of the Spirit, to take us through experiences. We had a very unusual, back in, this would have been in, let me think, 1960. I had, I had owned a business. As far as this world is concerned, I had it made. It was way, way back in the beginnings of things, but I owned a television cable system. It's like owning a public utility. And there were a lot of people on it, and they either had to hook up or go without. And plus, you sold them the television set, and you got to fix it when it, when it broke down. So it was a gold mine, literally. And I would have been a millionaire today several times over if I'd stayed with it, because the fellow that I sold it to is, except he was considerably younger than me, and he's no longer alive. So all that, he wasn't saved. I tried to, he understood the system, but he wasn't saved, and I felt to sell it to him. But he just laughed when I tried to talk to him about the Lord, made a joke out of it. But all, all the millions that he made in that business, he left behind. But I sold it. And from the sale, I had, a, I had a fairly good income. And I came, after I finished Bible school, which I shared, I came here. And I still had, I had an income for six years. That came Every week I got a nice check for six years. And so I came here and one day the Lord prompted me that I was to take the entire check and set it aside for a missionary project. And so I started to set it aside. About three, four weeks later, I was called in the office. And they said, we noticed that you're not paying your bill. And I said, I, I, I don't have the money to pay it. And they said, well, we know you do. <laughs> you do have the money. Because that was somehow they knew that I had an income. And they said, you do. And so I was told this. I said, you have... I think it was, I can't remember now exactly, it was so many days. You've got so many days to pay the bill or else you're to pack up and be out. Well, I, had, I was putting the checks in the bank, and, I, and it was all there. I could have written a check and paid it easily. But the Lord said to set the money aside. And I was up just outside of where... Jack and Joanne Picataggi's office is where there's a desk. And I was up on top of a ladder right in that area. That was sort of a lounge. It was a big open room and where the bookstore is now and all that was a big open, great big open room. And I was on a ladder spackling the patching a ceiling. And I think I had two days left. And it was so intense I couldn't eat. I wasn't able to eat. It was just really, because I knew, see, I'd had that visitation that I would be the president. And I knew I'd be the president of Pinecrest. And there was an impartation of what I was to do, I understood. And I knew I would be the president. And here I was, I was told I had two more, I had two more days to pay the bill or to move out. And I had enough money in the bank to pay it, far more than enough. Could have easily paid it. But the Lord said, I don't want any of the present students to hear this. <laughs> Just pretend you don't hear this. <laughs> so, um, I thought to myself, I was, I was up on top of this ladder, spackling the ceiling, and I was down to two days, and I was, I was suffering because of the intensity of the vision, and here I was being told I had to move out, and I had this, and I was waiting for them to get the revelation that I was supposed to be a teacher, thinking that I was, would function in, in, that, in, in that situation that was here, the school that was here. So I was waiting for them to get the revelation, and I was told I had to leave, or, el or pay, or pay or else. Well, just, just before this, about two days before, there was a, it used to be a bicycle factory. The Japanese did it in. But uh, there was a bicycle factory in Little Falls, and a fellow came, and, and I had had a dream the night before 
or something just just came to me real clear that Abraham was told to go to go into the land of promise and when he got there there was a famine so he went into so he went down to Egypt and he got in a lot of trouble and the Lord prompted me very clearly that if he had obeyed the Lord the Lord told him to go therefore because the Lord told him there would be provision See, but he, he got in trouble. He went to Egypt, and he got in trouble because he was told where to go. And when he got there, there was a famine. There wasn't any money. There wasn't any means. So he went to Egypt. And the Lord said, if, he, and, and the Lord said, if I told him to go, I would have provided. He should have trusted me, and he didn't. And so this fellow came to me and said, I heard you're having a problem about your bill. He said, they told me at work tonight to bring five people in tomorrow ready to go to work. Well, all I had to do was dig out my work clothes, go tell the office that I was going to work the next day and I would have the money and everything, my problems would have been over. And all at once I remembered <laughs> about going to Egypt. <laughs> and, I, and I knew I couldn't. I mean, I just knew that I knew that I couldn't. And that died. And so here I am up on top of the ladder, two days left. And I, I was suffering. And I thought, and I, and I began to think, and I thought, the voice that told me to come here, that spoke to me, when the Lord spoke, I'll let you go to Philadelphia, I will give you a ministry there, and I'll bless it. I was going to rent a storefront on Stanton Avenue in North Central Philly. I was in the car on my way, and I had to stop the car. The Lord spoke to me and told me to come to Pinecrest. I had to stop the car, turn around, and, come, and head north instead of south, and come here. I got back here, I could stand within two inches of the spot, where back in 1959 I stood right back here, and I said, Lord, you know that I don't want to come here, but I want your best. The Lord said, I will let you go to Philadelphia. I'll give you ministry there and bless it, but this is where I want you. So I said, yes, sir, and I enrolled as a student, and then this happened. Well, see, I knew all that. I said, that was that, the voice that told me that was the same voice that told me to put the money, to set the money aside. So if there, I'm, and the Lord spoke to me that I would be the president of Pinecrest, I'd be a teacher, and I would teach. And I said, if the voice that said all this, that told me that, that told me to come here, if, that, if, that, if that's wrong, then so is the voice that said to put the money aside. So I thought, I may as well get this over with. I said, what I'm going to do, if this is the Lord and the Lord sent me here, then this thing's got to come out right. So I, so I thought, it's the same voice. So I'm going to go and tell him I can't pay the bill, and then I'll go home and start packing, and I'll serve the Lord anyway. When I said, I said, I'll go home and pack, and I'll leave, and I'll serve the Lord anyway. When I said that, the presence of the Lord hit me, that I had to, I mean, I had to bend right over the top of the ladder and hang on. I, I would have literally fallen off. There was such a heavy presence came, and clearer than you can hear me, the Lord said, that was what I wanted to hear. Go and pay the bill. And then I was disappointed. Then I didn't want to. <laughs> I got all excited. I was going to go and tell him I couldn't. And the Lord said to pay it. And then I, I really, I didn't want to. I was disappointed. About a week later, there was a room. It's gone now. There was sort of a shower room down here that, that got tore out. And I was back down in there with the door shut, praying by myself. And the Lord said this. Abraham had received a promise from the Lord. Abraham received a promise of a son. That son was such a miracle and so divinely given in his old age, was so divinely given that Abraham, who was the friend of God, who had a unique relationship to God, became more interested in God's blessing or provision to him Isaac, that he was in the Lord. In other words, Isaac became more important to Abraham than God. And, and, and the Lord said this, he would, not, he would not allow us to have anything between us and him. Isaac got in between. 
And so the Lord said, take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Now Isaac was more important to Abraham than God. And Abraham did some wrestling, some struggling. And in that struggling, he knew the voice of the Lord. He knew the Lord spoke. And he made a decision that God was more important than Isaac. <clears throat> and God put him to the full test. Fortunately for most of us, he doesn't take us to the extent that he took Abraham. See, the Lord never intended for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. But he intended to bring a correction that he would be in first place and not Isaac. Mm -hmm. And so up the mountain they went with the wood, the sacrifice. And when the altar was fixed, Isaac was set on the altar, Abraham raised the knife. At that point, God was first. Isaac was second. Or said, that's all I wanted. I'm satisfied. And he, the lamb in the thicket paid the price instead and became the sacrifice. And a correction was made. For if there's something that's more important to us than God, we're in trouble. All right, the Lord, that, the Lord brought that revelation. I'd never heard that. I've heard a lot of things about Abraham going up the mountain, but I never heard that. I never heard it explained like that. And the Lord gave that. And then the Lord said this, I was taken up into visible glory, and I knew that I would be the head of Pinecrest. And I was so struggling with how that could be and when it would be that the revelation became more important to me than the Lord. You see, well, on top of so, so then the Lord arranged up on top of a ladder. That was my mountain. <laughs> I was on top of a ladder, literally, on top of a ladder. And when I said, I'll pack up, I'll pay the bill, I'll go and tell him I can't pay it, and then I'll pack up and I'll leave. When I said that, the Lord said, that's all I wanted. Now I'm back in first place. And I have to be careful. It's so easy for a ministry to come between us and the Lord with activity, with responsibilities. It's so easy for these things to get in between. But you see, the Lord brought a correction. He has to be in first place. Specifically, he talked of Abraham. He talked of David being a friend. John leaned on the breast of Jesus, heard the very heartbeat of the Lord. There was a unique relationship. He became the apostle of love. There was that unique relationship that, be, that is far transcends and is more important than anything we do for the Lord. And somehow, and today's economy, it seems that our activities, what we do, becomes more important than what we're becoming. We are his workmanship, created unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. And if you read the context, the real thought is, is that all these things merely are an activity to produce his image and his likeness within us. That it's what we're becoming that's important. And then at judgment day, to those whom he receives, he said, well done, not much done, well done. See, it's, it's, it's not how much we do, it's the way we do what we do. It's keeping our relationship to the Lord, our priorities right, and making the Lord, Lord. And so after, after I had told someone, there was a, a man that I knew that was going to go to South America, and I told him, and I just felt, and I was, the Lord said to set this money aside and that for a missionary project. And I told him I'd give him the money to go to South America. And that had to become a sacrificial lamb. That had to die. And I paid the bill. And the Lord taught me a lesson in that. And I've searched my heart from that day to this, from time to time, and carefully I've made a recommitment or a commitment or expressed, or I try to be careful to let the Lord know. And I've asked the Lord to correct me and chasten me in these areas that I don't have to go through something that extreme again. You see, it's so important to keep the Lord first. Every son that the Lord receives, he scourges. In other words, he will send us up the mountain with the thing that we love. And it will become a sacrifice until a correction comes. 
And so the Lord is faithful in drawing us unto himself. Atmosphere, our, the attitude of the heart, that which is within, our relationship to the Lord is far more important than what we do for the Lord. Now, when the relationship is right, we'll do a lot. We'll probably do even more. In the beginnings of the, secret, of the Song of Solomon and the Secret of the Stairs, the word says this, the bride confessed and said this, my mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. You see, she was working for the church, working for recognition, acceptance, trying to please others. And you can't do that, it don't work. That anger, see, the, the human, human beings are not capable of adequately rewarding you. In the 20 some odd years that I've been here, in the, speaking from the natural, the human, I would probably have every right to be bitter and critical and cynical if I was working for people. But a long time ago, I settled the issue that I'm not working for people. What people think or do or say, there's responsibilities and relationships that are important. But I'm not working for people. I'm working for the, for the Lord. My relationship is to Him. And so I have to keep that right. I shouldn't say working for. I should say to be, to be right. I should say working with because I trust it is that way. But people will do you in. A lot of ministers get bitter. A lot of ministers get hurt and quit because, because people affect them, and they will. You know, God is extravagant, and this is, this is, this is kind of cruel or mean, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> uh, I'll share a little story first. I was a number of several years ago, a couple, three, four years ago, I was in, I was in Detroit. A young man that graduated from Pinecrest tremendously capable, brilliant mind, nice personality, a lot of ability, said that he w decided in, that he wanted to start from the bottom. So he went to Detroit, to one of the worst areas, down where the steel, where the steel plants were, down towards River Rouge, in one of the worst areas where, where half the houses on each street were wrecked. And he managed to get a wrecked house from the city got it for almost nothing with, with, by, by agreeing to fix it up. And he moved, and he got it livable and moved in it and started a little church. He said he was going to start from the bottom. And, he, and he's built up. I mean, it's amazing what's happened. Well, I was there staying with him in that house that he'd fixed that had been wrecked and had a real nice little congregation in that area. And I was walking early one morning. It was probably not totally safe, but I was out quite early walking. And I don't know what people thought, but going down the street, there was this house was sort of a Cape Cod type, and it has an eaves trough across the front of the house, and there were some big maple trees. And the eaves trough had, because the, the air there was just, was not very good. <laughs> and the eaves trough was full, was full of dirt. All these maple seeds had come down, and there were probably thousands of maple trees growing in the eaves trough, about so high, right across the land. All these thousands of maple trees, just as happy as they could be, growing in an eaves trough. And I, I, I was fascinated, and I stopped, and I stood there and looked at that. I hope they don't know, I hope nobody thought I was, but I just looked, I mean, I looked and looked. I was just absolutely fascinated with these thousands of, I mean, thousands of them from one end of the house to the other, just a mass of little maple trees, just as happy as they could be. <laughs> if only they knew where they were. <laughs> I don't know what happened to them. But you see, that speaks of the extravagance of God, all those seeds on that tree. Thousands, thousands, literally, of maple trees growing in that eaves, eaves trough, the extravagance of God. And the average pastor really goes through it. And I've often wondered if, if God is saving some pastors and using congregations to perfect them. <laughs> see, see, God can afford to be extravagant. 
<laughs> and no one and no one knows how to perfect a pastor like a congregation. <laughs> they know how. And some sometimes they you know people wonder what their ministry is. But you see, a sinner a sinner can never do to you what a Christian can do. Isn't that right? Sure. But see, that's all in God's economy. He knows that. A Christian can work you over, but they're supposed to. You, you probably didn't know that. <laughs> see, see, they're supposed to because the Lord's perfecting something for eternity. And if you knew it, you wouldn't react and get all upset and say she said and he said and they said and, you know, and, and I'm, you know, and it's not right. You know, well, in the kingdom, you don't have any rights. You don't have any. See, all those things are meant to perfect something within. Now, I still remember when I was a kid and a bunch of kids get together and they start to tease another kid and work at him and tease. And if the kid didn't react, you quit. But supposing the kid really reacted tremendously, <laughs> that, that kid was done. <laughs> you know, see, because they reacted. You remember that. And the more they reacted, the more you worked on them. And the more enjoyment you got. Well, when the devil works you over and you react. <laughs> See, if you, if you say, I know who I am. I know where I'm going. You know, and you don't pay any attention. And you don't allow those things. And, and you don't feed on them. You ignore them. He, he'll, he, uh, he'll quit. They'll go have a special meeting and try to figure a different approach. Because <laughs> that one's not working. And so we're meant to... People will perfect you. Christians. And that's in God. We are created unto good works. What are the good works? The Lord brings arrangements into our life. People. And I remember a pastor saying once that there was a lady in his congregation that just sent him into orbit. And he could hardly stand her. And she upset him something terrible. And he said he prayed, he diligently prayed, Lord, get her out of here. And he prayed. And finally she left. Within a few weeks, another one showed up that was worse. <laughs> and he said, literally, he said, this actually happened. And he said, literally, he went and he repented. And he said, Lord, send the first one back. <laughs> See, <laughs> see, that's right. Because, see, the Lord is, the, it takes, you know, if you want to perfect, if you want to put a press in pants, it takes heat and it takes pressure. And we're being made conformable to the image of the Lord. And that's not easy. The situations, the circumstances, they have to be read rightly. They've got to be interpreted rightly. And when we do that, when a congregation or a body of people begin to interpret situations rightly, that we're being perfected, and when somebody really does you in and you say, thank you, you're really helping me, because I'm, I'm called to be an overcomer and you've given me something to overcome. Thank you. <laughs> Is that the way you handle it? <laughs> if everybody did that, the church would be glorious. <laughs> well, see, I, I would never say to you how many of you want to be an overcomer. I wouldn't do that because if you, if you were foolish enough to put your hand up, that means you want the Lord, that, then that obligates the Lord to give you something to overcome. So I wouldn't do that to you. See, you can't overcome unless you have something to overcome. Well, you've got plenty. Every, every, we, we do. It's there. The Lord has abundantly blessed us. <laughs> So for those that want to be an overcomer, there isn't any problem at all. You've got plenty of things. And the overcoming has to do with the attitudes of the heart. Not so much with the situation itself, but the attitude of the heart in the situation. See, it's the atmosphere that's important. That's where we were. Atmosphere. It's tremendously important. Now, when the atmosphere comes right and we begin to worship... And I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 6. And just go a little further with this. Isaiah chapter 6. Mm -hmm. 
We'll just run through this quickly. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah was a, was a godly king. He was a good king. Abraham, or I'm sorry, Isaiah, uh, well, we'll get there. Isaiah <laughs> had favor with Uzziah. And so he was taking things for granted. There wasn't a real seeking. Uzziah died. And another king took his place that was not favorable towards Isaiah. And Isaiah began to look upward. In the year that he died, I sought the Lord. Well, he should have sought the Lord before. <laughs> See? And the Lord granted a vision, the seraphim. I believe there are, there are no such a thing as, as seraphim. I believe this is cryptic. It's a type of an overcoming people that are in the heavenlies. We in faith and those that have gone on to the Lord. For some of you, I just want to say, I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but I want to say something. Um, I'm not quite sure how to say it, but you'll have to pray about this and think. I had an aunt. I just used two people, Walter Butler and Aunt Jenny. And my, uh, I have no brothers, no sisters, no uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, nieces. Going backwards, no family at all, no relatives that I know of. Uh, families all, all gone on, saved. But Aunt Jenny, my father had two sisters. And Aunt Jenny, we brought her here when she was 92. She lived by herself until she, or well, she was about 90 or 91, I think. She lived by herself. And I would talk to her about the Lord, and she would always, she never married, always worked, was diligent. And Aunt Jenny would say, I'm a good Methodist. I've, I, I, I've always gone to church, and, I, and, and I'm a good person. That's as far as I could get. And when she was 92, an elderly lady that we took in that had had, she had a marvelous deliverance ministry with a storefront ministry in Philadelphia, right in downtown Philly, and had ministered for years with a tremendous deliverance ministry, had taken people there with serious problems, and they came back absolutely delivered and set free. And this elderly lady, her name was Viola Wirtz, in her older age, we took her in, and she lived out her life here and went on to her reward. And when, she, when Aunt Jenny was 92, Viola Wirtz went over and reached her with salvation. The tears ran and she accepted the Lord into her heart. When she was 92, she died when she was 94. But she never came to chapel. She really never read a Bible. She was genuinely safe. She never read. She never came to chapel. She lived up, up and up behind the dining room in the little apartment, had it fixed nice for her. But she never, she never understood what was going on. She never overcame because she had no comprehension. See, my people perish for the lack of understanding. And Aunt Jenny died. She went to paradise. Paradise is a place awaiting. The artist, you know, you always picture people on the other side floating on a cloud with a harp. That's sort of right. I don't know, I don't know about the cloud and the harp, but it's, it's pretty accurate. It's really accurate. You see, there's a waiting. Now, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, many of the cults teach soul sleep. I remember I had to have an operation once, and they said count. So I started to count, one, two, three. And the next thing I know, I was wondering why I hadn't gone to sleep yet. And it was quite a few hours later. <laughs> and I was wondering why I hadn't gone to sleep yet. Well, I was just out of existence for that time. In a sense, annihilated. And soul sleep means that a person, those that believe that, it's not in the Word of God. Several of the Jehovah's Witness teach it. Seventh-day Adventist teaches it. Several of the cults do, some of the fringe religion, none of, there, there, there's no evangelical group of any order or magnitude that I know of that would teach soul sleep. But it means that when we, that, that what any person, any Christian that's ever died, including Stephen that was martyred, is sound asleep in the grave. I mean, totally incapacitated, 
until the last day, resurrection. I don't believe that. To be absent from the body is to be present. Now, Aunt Jenny is in paradise. She's there. She's not an overcomer. She'll never rule and reign. To him that overcometh will I give authority over the name. That's conditional. Aunt Jenny never heard that. She never knew it. The Methodist church that I was sitting in this same Methodist church where she attended in 1950 on a Sunday morning trying to figure out if there was a God and left the service having decided that there probably wasn't. Wandered into a full gospel church later and my life was transformed. But, um, and, and Jenny just, just, just never heard the real gospel. She never heard it. But that Sunday morning that I was sitting in church, they always read a scripture lesson from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'd heard scripture read because the pastor always talked politics, always politics, with some little bit of gospel mixed in with a political orientation. And I thought in the Old Testament it said that God spoke, that he did things. And, I heard, and then I'd gone to a Baptist meeting one time there was an ad in the paper about a teaching about the millennium and I went one night and I heard about this tremendous millennium about all the things that were going to happen and I sat there and wondered was there really a God and I said well the Bible says that there was a God that spoke that did things and there's and there's a, a millennium coming and they're saying that God's going to do things but that was either in the past or in the future but right now there's absolutely nothing and then the thought came to me, anybody can say what used to be and what's going to be. You can say a lot about what used to be. So I said, it's probably all a fake. And I left church in that frame of mind until I met the eternal I am. So Aunt Jenny never heard. But there was another man, Walter Butler. He was a teacher at the Bible school, and he lived in the presence of God. Before he died, he was booked, I believe, five years ahead all over the world in ministry and traveled overseas every opportunity he got. Was booked ahead five years. In other words, if you wanted his, him for ministry, every, every, all the free time he had, he traveled overseas. And he had to wait five years. He had a marvelous walk with the Lord. He was a man of God uniquely. Back years before, he had contracted cancer and a group of us got together and prayed and felt that we had prayed through and a few days later he got up and testified that like a glow and a warm heat came and went through him and he was healed. Mm -hmm. Then years later he was dying again of cancer. Years later and I began to pray earnestly for him. And the Lord gave me a revelation and understanding that I had never thought of. And the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord said this, I need him, he is need, but I said, but Lord, he has five years of ministry. He's, there's no one to take his place. There's no one today that could walk in Walter Butler's shoes. There's no one alive today that, 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 is, it, that has the relationship, and I, I hear and see a lot in traveling and ministers and all that I contact, and I'm not putting a man on a pedestal, but I'm saying I don't know of anyone in the world today that could walk in that man's shoes and pay the price that he paid for the walk that he had with the Lord, to have the quality relationship that he had. I don't know of anyone that has gone to that extent or cultivated what he had and paid the price that he did. And I was saying, I was, I was saying, Lord, he's needed. He's needed. And the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord said, I need him. He's needed more on the other side. I shared this with his wife later, and she said that, it, that, that she, she felt like the Lord confirmed it, and she felt a peace. But the word was this. The Lord said, he's needed on the other side. And the Lord gave me a vision and an understanding that there's an overcoming people. See, the average Christian will be resurrected at the last day, but is in paradise, just waiting playing their harp or just, just waiting. The average Christian is there. But there's an overcoming people that are overcomers that at the point of death are moving into a greater ministry. 
There was a man that had a unique, back in 1924, he had a remarkable <clears throat> visitation of God and had formed a ministry about visitation in the last days. He died when he was in his mid-80s. And he was believing the Lord to keep him alive. And we had, I had prayed for him, and the Lord gave a word that, his, that he was looking for a lengthening of his days. And the word was that his children would see that, but that he would be taken. Now, this is, this is kind of heavy, what I'm going to say. And you'll have to think about this, and I'll say this very carefully, and you'll have to consider it. A man that I trust, a student here that I would trust. This was back in the 70s. Right out here, where all this big hole is, was a concrete, big concrete slab. This man walked up to this student that knew him. At, this is two or three years after he died. Walked up to him and said to him, I made it. I made immortality. And then he was gone. And he came and told me. I wondered about it for a long time, and I had been praying for Walter Butler. A few years, several years ago, I was visiting someone in the Washington, D.C. area, and they put another minister and I, they put us up in a Holiday Inn in Washington, D.C., where there was three or four levels of parking under the hotel, a high-rise with three or four levels underground. We were probably three levels down, and the presence of the Lord came in that car. And the Lord unfolded an understanding to me. And I'll give you scripture for what I'm saying in a minute. And the Lord said, that was this man. I'd rather not say his name. The Lord said, that was him. He was there. He made it. He's up. He, he is an overcomer. And there's an army in the throne, around the throne, that are there as intercessors, praying, that are involved in ministry. He's more active today in ministry than he was in life in a different dimension. You see, but God is gathering an army that's coming against principalities. Mm -hmm. And that army's increasing. Glory, hallelujah. hallelujah. See, that army's increasing yeah. and principalities are being brought down mm -hmm. from that gathering army of saints that have walked with the Lord, that paid a price, that never perhaps found a fulfillment in this life or came to any great ministry, but they paid a price they overcame in life, and they're being gathered up into that army that's bringing down principalities. And they're in that army. And the Lord said, I'm gathering an army unto myself, and I need these. I've taken them because they're needed more there than here. Walter Butler is functioning today in, in ministry in a greater dimension than he was in life, this other man. And Jenny is, and she's in paradise. At the end of time, at the end of the millennium, when at the at the Trump, she, she will come up in resurrection. But at the beginning of the millennium, the beginning of, of the government of God, the millennial reign, the this this overcoming army mm -hmm. will receive glorified bodies and rule and reign. Amen. The mass of Christianity will never see that, never have a part until the end. And if you read the book carefully, it'll verify what I'm saying. I'll give you a verse for what I'm saying. Revelation chapter 19. This is kind of heavy and you've got to be careful with it because See where I just see where I want to start. All right, verse nine. This is not the best place, but Revelation chapter nineteen, verse nine. This is a visitor to, to John. And he said unto him, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, not everybody's called. Blessed are they which are called, not everybody is. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Now this is John. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. Now this, this is a being that came, as it were, an angel. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren. 
that have the testimony of Jesus worship God. So this was one. I, I feel that this was, now his name, um, that was martyred. The Apostle Paul was there. I mentioned his name. Stephen. Stephen. I believe this was Stephen. I mean, I really believe that, that this was Stephen. See, that he was an overcomer. Jesus stood and received him up. He didn't go into paradise. He went up into the throne. He was received. Jesus stood to welcome him to the throne. He was an overcomer. And yet John, John knew him. And John said, see that you do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And John, this is just as John that, that leaned on the breast of Jesus, that, was, that saw the transfiguration, that had, that had great understanding. And yet, and, and yet he didn't realize that he was seeing one in spirit, in spirit form, because the, the resurrection hasn't come. In spirit form, functioning in the heavenlies in a ministry. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, sometimes the real result of our faith is not worked out in life. We don't always, the Lord puts us through tremendous things and we, we, we face all kinds of decisions and pressures. And we say, I don't understand, I don't have any ministry, I don't have any, there isn't any, there isn't anything, but there is. Because, see, God's perp, God is extravagant, like all those little maple trees. He's not so much concerned. He's marked the people out for himself, and they are being redeemed, and they're coming and being drawn. But within that, within the church, there are many of us that are, that are really not known. That's not important, to have some great ministry or be known. You say, but I don't have a ministry. I've gone. I prepared myself. I went to Bible school. I studied. I love the Lord. I've devoted my life, and I don't, I don't have it. Nothing's happening. Well... That's not so bad. It's not much done. It's what? Well done. Thou good. I just want to share something. Well done. Good and what? F-A-I-T-H. F-U-L. See, good. That word good. That's interesting. Faithful. That's what the Lord's... Faithfulness. That's the important thing. Well done. Not much. Not much well. It's the way you do what you do. It's the attitude of heart. It's the working of the Lord within. Good. There's another word that's similar to that. See, good, when somebody says you're good, what they're really say, if somebody says you're good, what they're really saying is that you are like God. That's what that means. You are, you are like God. That's what they're saying. When they, when they tell you you're good, they're saying you are like God. And we are called to be made conformable to his image, to be like him. We are called to be good, to be like him. That's what that really means. We've been changed. We've been made conformable to his image. And then we're lifted up into a higher dimension of life and ministry. So the real purpose of the Lord is to perfect us, to bring us through. It isn't so much ministry or doing this or that. There may be that. There are those that are called to that. God hath set in the church. And, and he'll do that. He'll choose from among. He'll take those whom he calls and chooses out of the sheepfold, out of the place of, of ministering on, the, on just the everyday walk-a-day level in the sheepfolds, ministering there faithfully. And there are those that he'll bring up and anoint into a place of calling or ministry. He'll do that. He'll choose out certain ones. But that's his choosing and his ordination, but that's really not the important thing. The important thing is that we're faithful wherever we are. Mm. To him that overcometh, not to him that's become an apostle or prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, it's to him that overcometh. 
and it's available to all. Not everyone is going to find themselves functioning in some great ministry, even though they've come into a marvelous sense of revelation and understanding and relationship. But that's not the important thing. And Jenny will see, will, will see resurrection at the end of the thousand years, way at the end of time, at the final judgment, and she'll enter into the eternal ages. Let me show you one other thing while we're here. Revelation chapter 5, along this line, and we'll see, we never did get, we'll have to come back to Isaiah tomorrow night. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 7. Cain. We'll just start Revelation chapter 5, verse 7. He came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Now this is this overcoming people that are caught up to the throne. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed who? Us. Some of the newer translations, because translators have a problem with this, because it says four beasts and 24 elders. And some of them put the word them. If you have a newer translation, it may say them. If you have a King James, it says us. I still use a King James, because people's heads, translators, all have heads. And their, their own reasoning gets, gets in. And I use other, other translations just for reference. I talked to a man in Boston. I've talked to Brother Hoyer. I've talked to others. A man in Boston that had the equivalent in Greek text, a scholar, with equivalent of 17 years on the college level. Talked with him personally about this verse, and I asked him, us, is that, and he said, us is the better translation. It could be translated then, the books will say that, but us is the better translation. Thou hast redeemed us. To God, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. There are nations that no longer exist. This spans all of history, from creation, from Adam until our day. This is all nations. And hath made us, made us. When Jesus called... <coughs> the disciples from fishing. He said this, follow me and I will make you to become fishers. He said, I didn't call, he didn't say, follow me and you'll fish. He said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers. Hath made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall what? Reign. Reign. Now, four beasts, 24 elders, 24 can be broken down. 12, 12. This spans all of history, every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. That spans all of history. There were 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament that were, that were the centrality in the Old Testament were the patriarchs and the nation that, that grew out of that, Israel. But it came through the patriarchs and the progression the twelve patriarchs, the twelve apostles. There were twelve apostles were built upon that foundation, were built upon the foundation, upon that foundation of twelve, and at the end there's a multiplication of that, the 144,000 is the progression in God. That's not a literal number, but, but it's a progression from the twelve to the 144,000. So that spans the 12 of the Old Covenant, the 12 of the New, that, that were built upon that. And we are the extension of that. So the 24 elders represent the Old and the foundation of the New, the, patri the, 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 the apostles of the New and that, and that projection. The four living creatures, 
We have it in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7. The first beast was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third has the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. This same revelation is given in Ezekiel, and it talks about the four sides or the four faces. A lion speaks of authority. The calf, it's a calf in Revelation, it's, it's an ox in Ezekiel. The calf is the higher type. An ox is for service. A calf is for sacrifice or service. It's the higher type. The third is the face of a man. It speaks of our fellowship with the Lord. The fourth is a flying eagle. It speaks of spirituality. These are the four sides of an overcoming people, of overcomers that are called to the Lord. The Old Testament, the, the apostles, and then the new, in, in the New Testament, the progression of that up into an overcoming people, the four living creatures, spiritual authority, a sacrificial life, the cross, fellowship with the Lord, spirituality. They're the sides of maturity. And these are singing a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us by thy blood of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation that spans all of history, and hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign. Where? In the millennial reign. To him that overcometh will I give authority over the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. The man-child caught up to rule the nations. So we have this. Now, there's another group. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindred and people and tongues. Does that sound familiar? It spans all of history. There, there are nations that no longer exist. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, that spans all of history, stood before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palms in their hands, and they what? What's the next word in verse 10? And what? cried. In chapter 5, verse 9, and they what? They sang. Not, these are two different groups. And Jenny is in chapter 7 of Revelation. Walter Butler is in chapter 5. They cried with a loud voice saying what? Salvation. That's all they had. They were saved, but they never went any further. They were saved, and they said, we're, we're going to heaven. That's it. As long as we get in, that's all we care about. They cried, saying, salvation. The other group said, thou hast made us unto our God. What was their confession? What, what, uh, who were they? Kings and priests. They said, thou hast made us. The progression, the development of our spiritual life, our walk with the Lord, our relationship. Thou hast made us kings and priests. That's that foresight, that, that overcoming. But here they cried with a loud voice saying salvation. Verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and what? Serve. Serve. In chapter 5. Thou hast made us under God kings and priests, and we shall what? Reign. Reign. There's a big difference. Big, big difference. There are those that will serve through eternity that will, that will be resurrected at the last day. But there is an overcoming people that will be caught up to be changed, to meet him in the air, that will come and rule and reign with him in that thousand-year reign an overcoming people. There's an army being prepared in the heavens even now that are displacing principalities. That's allowing the progression of understanding that we're having today, the moving of the Spirit within our being, within our lives. Hallelujah. Each of these groups came in a unique way to salvation. One went further. The other just stayed there and, were, and was satisfied. Never went further. 
in, in Matthew, we won't turn to it, but in Matthew 25, you've got ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. Another way to say it, five, the door entered, the door to the kingdom, to this overcoming people, to the millennial reign, to resurrection, to come up into the throne, the five wise entered in and the door was shut. And the foolish didn't enter in. They were saved. They went to buy, they came back, but they were too late. The five wise are found in chapter 5 of Revelation. The five foolish can be found in chapter 7. And you'll find this. The whole book will come alive if you see this. And you realize that there's something more than just being saved. There's something more than just going to church. Than waiting that someday we're just going to heaven. We're going to walk on streets of gold. There's something more. The Lord's doing a tremendous work within a people that have discernment, that are open, that are willing to allow him to perfect them. And once you see this and you recognize this, then you're willing. You just say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy purpose. And we submit ourselves to the hand of God, recognizing that he has a purpose and that he's not going to let us down. We may function in some great way in life. We may not. Not everybody can. Not everybody will. But the important thing is that we're ready in that day, at that when the sound of the when that trump, that last trump, and the dead in in Christ, in this relationship, this overcoming people are going to be caught up to meet him, and they'll rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. They sang a new song in chapter 5. In chapter 7, they cried, saying salvation. You see, our testimony tells what we, that's, our, that, that's what we are, what we testify. Chapter 7, they said salvation. Chapter 5, they said, King, thou hast made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Revelation chapter, chapter 2 in verse 26, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's, that's, that's their confession, exactly. An overcoming people, it's qualified. Hallelujah. By the grace of God in this day, there are people that are hearing, that are considering, that are allowing the Lord to do an inner work, that are recognizing that there's something more than just going to heaven, that there's an overcoming, an entering in to his higher purposes, to make ourselves available to the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I know that's what I said about I'm not looking for angels or I don't have or anything, or, and no one's walked up to me, and I'm not expecting it. But the Lord spoke to me that that really happened. I knew this man. I was very close to him. I knew him very well. He had a tremendous walk with the Lord, and he was believing. And when he said he made it, he, he's there. He's not, he's, he's, he's not in paradise with a harp and a cloud, just waiting, patiently waiting. He's functioning. There are those that are. That's a tremendous thing, to be a part of that army of God that's being gathered in this day. The present and the past, but all present in his, in, in his sight. Amen. Hallelujah. You'll have to pray about that and think about it. And I just want to say one thing more. These things are, are given in a sense of direction. But some take these things. There was a group that got involved in angels and visitation, and they went way too far with it. And I think the, the important thing is the principle to challenge us, not to take it and run it way out, because it can become dangerous. And sometimes it's, you've got to be, it's, it's good to be cautious in sharing some of these, because the things that I'm saying, the Lord has given by revelation. The thing that I just shared, I shared it, years ago in a class in the morning 
the Lord moved on it so tremendously. That class, we got out at, I think, 3.30 in the afternoon. A tremendous visitation. And that came by, well, I never read that, I've never heard what I'm sharing. But that came in Revelation. I never heard that explained that way. And if you check what I'm saying, if you listen to it, or on the, it's on the tape, and you check the book, it does not contradict, but it will open the book and make it meaningful. Because I'm very, very careful, and by the grace of God, Pinecrest, what we stand for, I know that the Lord gave this. See, the Lord, that time I was caught up, that I was, it was the preparation of a people. I was caught up for a preparation of a people for his end time purpose. And this, and what I'm saying tonight is at the very heart of what the Lord showed me, the new birth. The new birth, it's like the wind. It's like the wind. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell from whence it cometh or whither it go. So is everyone that is born, airborne, moves up into this dimension. He's calling a people up into this dimension of spiritual reality that transcends churchianity, just church and streets of gold in paradise. Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand together. Father, I, I thank you for your word. Lord, I just take this that's been spoken and I carefully submit it before you before your word, that it be true. And I sanctify it that the enemy cannot touch it or pervert it in any way. Lord, we just place it under that shed blood that the enemy cannot cross, under that protection of, of your sacrificial life that you gave and that in resurrection you ascended and through the atonement of that blood, we have life and we can enter into all that you have. And I sanctify that which I've spoken, Lord, that we may be careful, that it may become. Paul said, I press towards the mark for the prize. And Lord, I thank you that you've granted us an understanding in a limited way, an understanding of the marvels of this redemption and all that's available to us that far transcends. And yet, Lord, we have nothing to be proud of. But we humbly submit ourselves, acknowledging that understanding, truth, and revelation comes from you, and it's yours. And Lord, that we may take it humbly, and allow it to do its work within us that we might be changed. Lord, deliver us from any measure of, of feeling exalted or having some great revelation. Deliver us from that and set us free. For Lord, we come humbly, for to whom much is given is much required. Lord, there's nothing to be proud of, but we become responsible. And Father, each one of us tonight, to the best of our ability, we ask that we may become a part of this overcoming army that you're gathering in life, that we may become a part of that, 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 that strengthened army under your anointing, your enabling, the testings, the provings, the identification, that we may be increasingly caught up into that place of authority that even as the darkness of this world increases, that the light of the kingdom age may develop and grow within a people that are understanding in this day. Oh, you gave understanding, Lord, to your people. And I pray, Lord, that we may begin to understand what you're doing, that we can see beyond all the limitations that have hindered us and held us down. Father, release us to become a heavenly people, a spiritual people in this day, caught up, Lord, into your purpose. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
If you'd like prayer while we're singing, just, just stand up here and we'll pray with you.